Europe is at a truly unique point in its history, with the financial crisis creating not just volatility, but also spurring on regulatory change and fragmentation as everyone looks to find that ever-elusive liquidity. To discuss this today, I'm joined by Andrew Sharp, partner and sales trader at Redburn Partners. Hello. Hello. So, first of all, perhaps if you could introduce Redburn and uh, yourself. Of course. Um, Redburn is an agency stockbroker, an institutional agency stockbroker. Um, we've been in business since 2003 now. Um, it was set up by a fellow called Jeremy Evans, who used to work for JP Morgan um, prior to that Flemings. Um, and he spotted a gap in the market for high quality research, backed up with um, competent execution. Um, and we've been exploiting that gap ever since, um, to great effect, I'm pleased to be able to say. As to my background, I've spent 20 years in the markets. Um, I've worked for a variety of larger banks, including Morgan Stanley and UBS, and have been at uh, Redburn as a partner since 2006. So you can't talk about the Eurozone without mentioning MIFID II. The proposals have finally been released. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, the most prominent thought is that MIFID II will undeniably lead on to MIFID III. Um, there are so many unanswered questions in there um, that it becomes completely inevitable, in my opinion, or in our opinion, I should say. Um, now, without wishing to sound too dramatic as well, I do think that MIFID II has some profound implications for the European equity markets. Um, not all of which I suspect will be entirely welcome to the major practitioners. Um, one thing that struck me, for example, was that ESMA, the European Securities um, and Markets Authority, looks set to accrue a considerable amount of power, um, including, and I'm going to quote here directly because I didn't want to get this wrong, uh, the power to ban products, practices or services where there are concerns or threats to the orderly functioning of financial markets or stability of the financial system. Which is pleasantly vague. Extraordinarily vague and extraordinarily encompassing. It could be pretty much anything that somebody around Europe doesn't like. Now, you know, in, in an equity market context, for example, what would have happened over the recent short selling ban? It was only applied selectively around Europe. It was only applied in certain markets. Um, would they have expected that to have been blanket applied across all jurisdictions, including those who really had no interest in applying it at all? Um, I think there are a number of unanswered unanswer questions here, and perhaps that highlights the tension in the um, politics, if you like, of MIFID. You know, we had Michel Barnier, the European Commissioner who's responsible for financial regulation, and again, I'm going to quote, so I don't want to get him wrong, um, but he said that financial markets are there to serve the real economy and not the other way around. Now, that's partly true, but that's not necessarily entirely true in some of the countries around Europe which have particularly well-developed financial markets, and obviously I'm thinking particularly of London. Is that... Um, something that we're going to live to regret, um, particularly in London, although I suspect also in places like Frankfurt, which have very uh, highly and well-developed financial markets. Um, is this more about the politics of finance and less about the regulation of finance? Um, you know, the Eurosceptic in me suggests probably about the politics. The Europhile in me, of course, is, is willing to believe it's all about the... Uh, uh, the politics, uh, sorry, the, the finance. Yeah, well, it does seem to suggest that perhaps maybe they were released to placate the, uh, the politicians to some degree. that, they're, that It's written in very political language rather than financial language. As, as you said, there's a lot of vagaries all the way through. Uh, well, exactly. Uh, and it is so vague in certain areas that uh, it does leave, I think, the markets open to um, some unexpected and unintended consequences down the line. As I say, you know, an Italian politician, for example, springs up and starts campaigning against something. It may very well become domestic Italian policy to suit and placate domestic Italian voters, but it might not suit everybody in Europe. Um, and that really does leave the door open. Of course, there are a number of other tensions with regard to um, ESMA. You know, who regulates them? Who's going to set their agenda? How are they going to be resourced? Um, where does this leave the national regulators? Um, I think these are yet more questions that really actually we could have done with some sort of vague ideas of answers to. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I read about that I thought was particularly interesting was the proposal that infers, and I use the, use the word uh, quite loosely, that traders will have to, to run their algos continuously throughout trading hours, even if the markets change. And that, I can see, that again, the politics behind it, but perhaps it's not, it, again, it seems a bit vague and maybe not the most sensible way of trying to regulate markets. Well, again, I wonder with that whether or not perhaps the intention is to aim at, at the wrong target. It seems fairly clearly, to me at least, or to us, that it's designed to target the high-frequency traders. Um, as you know, the people who exploit minute price discrepancies 
um, very, very frequently over the course of a trading day to make sizable amounts of money or so, it would seem. Um, is it entirely appropriate to use a sledgehammer to crack a nut? How important are the hedge, high frequency traders when it comes to actually uh, the process of providing and um, withdrawing liquidity from the European markets? And again, I hesitate to blame them for everything that they are commonly um, labelled with uh, because I don't think it's entirely fair. Again, actually, I found some statistics on this. On October the 19th, and apologies for, for reading, but the Deutsche Börse investigated a flash crash um, in late August. Now, on that particular occasion, stock index futures in Germany were down 4% in a matter of seconds before recovering. It was assumed that HFTs, or high-frequency traders, were, were to blame. Um, but actually, when they looked into it, it wasn't at all. It was just a barrage of selling by financial uh, institutions. And actually, high-frequency traders were mopping up um, the mess. So one wonders whether or not, as I say, they're perhaps aiming at the wrong target. And also one wonders if there's legitimate market making going on um, in some of these markets that they're talking about regulating, well, if I was a market maker, I wouldn't be particularly keen to do that because, of course, it also says regardless of market conditions. Um, would you want to have your prices out there regardless of market conditions? Oh, Under all conditions? I don't think so. So either that business goes somewhere else or it just goes away completely. Who's going to deliberately sit on the sinking ship? Exactly. And again, there's this proposal to commercialise the consolidated tape for Europe. and do exactly the opposite. It seems like a U-turn on what, what people are actually asking for in the first place, and that we might be creating, by accident, multiple tapes from multiple companies, no one area having everything that you need. And it seems like it's going to get more confusing, not less. Quite possibly. It's one of the very few areas, actually, where I can see a need for a sort of public utility. I mean, having just argued that perhaps less regulation is better, maybe in this case, in this instance, a little bit like, for example, the um, European mobile phone um, common standards. Um, uh, a consolidated tape that was mandated and becomes effectively a public utility makes some sense. Um, the problem I think we have still, certainly from an execution standpoint, is that with the multiplicity of, of different um, tapes available, it is virtually impossible for us to prove the still undefined best execution. Um, without a consolidated tape, how on earth are you supposed to get to best execution? I, think we could spend, I don't know the answers to that. Yeah, we could spend hours talking about what defines bex, best execution. That's going to get even worse now by the sound of I, it. I would say so. Although, generally speaking, I have to say I would prefer a commercial solution to a, a, a government-mandated one because I don't think one size fits all as a rule. But on this occasion, I think maybe an exception uh, makes sense. So moving on to fragmentation, <coughs> which is what you'll be talking about in the panel, how you're going to, uh, so this is the panel session at um, Trade Tech France. You're going to be discussing how to exploit it to find natural liquidity. What's out there that's not currently being done? Well, from a Redburn point of view, not very much, I'd say, is the answer. We actually are fairly agnostic where, how we trade. We are interested solely in best price and in um, liquidity. Um, and as long as we get a, a satisfactory amalgam of the two, then we're very, very relaxed about where we trade. So from our perspective, I don't think there's very much more that we could be doing, could be doing at this point. Um, as to the rest of the market, I couldn't say. I mean, they're responsible for their own business practices. So how do you think Mifid's going to affect fragmentation then? Well, I would have thought it would make it worse. I mean, again, going back to what we were talking about just now with regard to the continuous algo, for example, you know, if market makers disappear, that's actually very bad news for liquidity. And again, that's something that doesn't take account of national differences. You know, UK second liners have historically always been market make it, making stocks. Um, what's going to happen to the liquidity with those if they disappear from some of these new um, types of facility? I equally, I can see a situation where perhaps French second liners um, consolidate much, much more to the two or three brokers who already have a bit of a lock on these things. Um, is that particularly good for competition or liquidity? Um, it also has pricing implications as well, I think. And I'm not talking necessarily about prices of stocks. I'm talking about the price of execution. Um, one of the reasons why commissions got compressed and were able to be compressed while keeping banks in, in some sort of business was because, obviously, um, a lot of these guys were actually internalizing flow and using alternative trading venues um, and therefore not paying exchange fees. If these sorts of things start to migrate back to exchanges, and you can see a certain set of circumstances where it, get, it becomes much more expensive to trade and execute, at which point liquidity will, I would have thought, inevitably dry up.
in the same way. And how, how do you think that we've heard the talk of all the mergers that may or may not be happening, that are constantly being back, batted backward and forward? And how do you think they're going to affect, assuming that they happen, uh, liquidity in general and, of course, fragmentation? We were talking about this three or four years ago, um, pre Chiax, Turquoise, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, and we said at the time that we thought mergers were inevitable. I think, still think there will be more of them, but it's a fluid enough marketplace that there will be new entrants. That doesn't particularly concern me. Um, I don't think it matters so much if the established MTFs um, end up consolidating. Um, where it does bother me is some of the new rules that are being applied with regard to proprietary flows, for example, um, in broker crossing networks. Um, that could I can I can very much see that uh, causing damage to liquidity. Um, again, it's, an, it's not a particularly clear rule that they're talking about applying. Um, but what it does seem to me, or what seem to us again, is clearly that the outcome of that um, will be that it'll be very difficult for some players to continue as they have been. You could argue that politically that may or may not be a good thing, but from a purely li liquidity standpoint, uh, I can't see it being a particularly positive thing. Yeah, the, the, the politics versus the... Once again, markets. back to the politics yeah. versus to the nece necessity of regulation. And nobody, I think, is really complaining about the idea of regulation. I just think it's about the application and how it's done. Um, and it seems to me that there are a number of things in this that haven't necessarily been thought through from the bottom up, while they may still make a great deal of sense from the top down. So if we could talk maybe more generally, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of MTFs versus traditional exchanges. And what are the best ways to incorporate MTFs into, a into your liquidity strategy? It goes back to what I was saying earlier. From a Redburn standpoint of view, we're completely agnostic. I mean, we don't actually care where we trade as long as we're trading to the advantage of the client, the end client. All our business is uh, agency. All of it is on behalf of institutional clients. Um, as long as they're getting the best price and all the best, best best access to liquidity. Um, I don't care whether it's an, an MTF or, or an established exchange. I mean, obviously, the costs from our perspective are slightly different, but we, it's incumbent on us to provide best execution, so that's what we have to do. Dark pools, what's the future of them? It's a, one of those things, it's, it's possibly got the most evil-sounding name in all of, of finance, but at the same time, it makes it very misunderstood, I think, about what the purpose of them are and why they're actually an advantage, but is there perhaps a danger of over-regulation coming in because of perhaps even as simple as something as simple as a name that will destroy the liquidity that they were actually intended to create in the first place? It's funny you say that because it seems to me that if they'd been called alternative execution venues or something like that, it's very unlikely they would have elicited anywhere near as much attention as they have. But calling them dark pools and giving this sort of sinister air was very foolish. Um, yeah. I don't know who came up with the idea, but they should be... Yeah. Um, yeah, made, to, made to pay. Um, is there a risk? Yes, there is. I mean, there's obviously a risk that the more regulation um, you get on these things, the, the less dark they become. Is that a bad thing? Well, I put myself in the shoes of the buy side on this one. Um, if I was on the buy side and I knew some of my business was going into a dark pool, I'd be very keen to find out what was actually going on in that dark pool. So I have no problem at all with um, their desire to find out a little bit more about how these things operate um, and who's behind them. Yeah, I guess the question is to what d degree you want to be able to do that before it actually defeats the whole purpose of having them of course. in the first place. Uh, and there is a risk that, yeah, that, that they get watered down to such an extent there's no purpose in having them. But of course, you know, mankind is an ingenious, or is capable of great ingenuity, and I'm quite sure that there, there will be alternatives um, cooked up. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Andrew, but unfortunately that's all we've got time for today. If you would like to find out more, however, please make sure to visit www.tradetechfrance.com. Thank you.